Welcome to On the Ice here on ASTV and all our social media platforms. Thanks for watching Tuesdays and Thursday nights at 6 o'clock Central. Tonight's guest, while he's gotten a bit of a promotion, not only is he one of the scouts or the head scout for the Des Moines Buccaneers in the USHL, he's also been given the title Director of Canadian Scouting for the San Diego Sabres. We're going to talk to Wayne Cozier here in just a few seconds and give us a bit of clarity in how Phase 1 and Phase 2 scouting works as well as junior hockey in Canada and the United States because it's such a whirlwind going on right now. We've got the man, we've got the myth, and soon enough the legend, Wayne, joining us here on the ice. Wayne, thanks for joining me tonight on the ice. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing real well with you. Thanks for having me. I hope I said your name right, your last name right, correct? It's pretty pretty good. It's Kozier. Kozier, so okay. Kinda, so I figured it was – Yeah. It's almost like Tutkaluk, right? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of. <laughs> so first off, i got to say to you, congratulations. You get to wear two hats tonight, three hats. You get to be my guest. You're also a scout with the Buccaneers in the USHL, but you're now one of the you're the director of Canadian scouting for the San Diego Sabres. Tell us how that's going to work here in the upcoming months for you working in two different leagues. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks a lot there, Theo. Really appreciate you having me on and the congratulations there. And, you know, ultimately, uh, many of the people in the scouting world wear multiple hats and work for a number of different teams type thing you know, as long as there's no conflict. And certainly with the San Diego Sabres of the U.S. Prep Hockey League, uh, it's really a feeder system into the North American Hockey League, uh, to the USHL, and, you know, longer term into the NCAA group. So it's, it's a really great fit. So when Thomas Capusta, the president of the Sabres, approached me about this, I was excited about the opportunity. No, that's a tremendous uh, outlook for you. I mean, working with the Sabres, I love San Diego. I've never had a bad time in San Diego. And Thomas has got a great program running there in the prep league. So congratulations on that to you. i got to ask you Thank this you. first question because when you explained to me off air, Wayne, there's a big difference when it comes to draft classes and ages. Explain to me a little bit between phase one and phase two draft classes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there definitely is a huge difference between the Canadian Hockey League or as we know in Western Canada, the Western Hockey League draft and the USHL draft. And, I mean, as you mentioned, there is two components to the USHL draft uh, that'll be coming up here early May. I think it's the 4th and 5th of May. It will be the 2021 draft. And there is a phase one draft that will happen on day one. And then the phase two draft happens on day two. Now, phase one will be just the, the younger kids, the 15-year-olds for that year. So there'll be 10 rounds. Uh, every team will have their picks of the best 15-year-olds uh, around the world. It's wide open to, you know, Globally, so Europeans, there is import limits uh, within the league, but uh, any 2005, it'll be this year, is available worldwide. Then day two, uh, the phase two draft is for anybody that was 15 years to 20 years old. That's a free agent. So again, it's not just the younger kids. It will also be, you know, this year it'll be 2003s, uh, twos, ones, and also down to 04s and 05s, and ultimately. Anybody that's not signed and protected on a team is eligible for the phase two draft. So it makes it very, very interesting. And so you got to watch an awful lot of hockey players to, to keep up on that. So speaking of watching a lot of hockey players during this pandemic, certainly you haven't been visiting as many rinks in person. Right. Based on that, how many videos have you been considering looking at saying, okay, this is really good talent and, this is more of a video that should be on uh, another show, perhaps. Yeah, good question. I mean, I don't get a lot of individual video. I mean, I do some from some players, uh, from a lot of agents. I'll get some videos on specific players and stuff. But more so, it's myself making a targeted list, uh, working with the various player advisors and agencies that have relationships, um, various teams throughout Western Canada. Uh, I have relationships with pretty much every you know, junior A team in, in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, also the midget AAA levels, relationships with all of them. So, and then as well as a number of agencies. And so it really makes my work a lot easier 
because uh, I have a lot of eyes up there looking for me. And so I'm continually getting emails and texts on different players and stuff. And so I, I try to be pretty meticulous about keeping track of lists. And then when I get opportunity, I will review video off of hockey TV on, on the various players that I have and try and get my rankings and, uh, you know, just rate the players appropriately and enter that data into to RinkNet software. And then come May, we're hopefully we're prepared to, for when the draft comes around. How many, so phase one, how many rounds of drafting is there phase one and phase two? Uh, so phase one is 10 rounds. And uh, again, very similar to the, the Western Hockey League in a lot of ways. People trade their draft picks. So sometimes you may have your actual 10 picks. Sometimes you may have six or sometimes you may have 14, but there is 10 rounds. And then phase two is a little bit of a different beast. It basically goes as many rounds as is required until everybody passes. And basically when you draft somebody, you have to basically put them onto your list. So depending on how much, how many spots you have available, uh, you ultimately have to stop picking when you have no room to put that person on a protected list. So is that a considered a protected list then? So they're, then they become the rights property of that team? Correct. Until they go to camp. So the main camps typically happen, you know, within a month or two after the draft. And so those players will go to camps and then there's basically just a cut down uh, process that happens to where you get your final rosters. But uh, the initial round, I think, at a main camp, I think it's 30 or something you cut it down to from the initial 45 to 50. And then from there, then going through closer to the season, it'll just get down to the final roster, which is somewhere in that 23 or I think this year was 25 due to the pandemic. How has the scouting aspect for you, like the big beast of it is, Wayne, changed for you during this pandemic the most? Has it been the fact that you haven't seen players in person or is it, do you see... Let me start with that question first. Yeah, well, it definitely has changed it. I mean, I'm still old school. So, I mean, I still like to see the person live. There's so many things that you can see live that you can't see on video. And I mean, obviously, uh, the analytics is getting huge in the game and a lot of people are big believers in that. And I certainly believe that there's a role to play for analytics and all that stuff in the game. But I still believe that it's critical to see a player and to see him live so you can see what that player does away from the puck what's his body language on the bench and stuff. Uh, there's so many other things that go into making a, a player decision. I have never seen an analytic for instinct on the ice. Have you? <laughs> no. Because I'm, no, I'm, I'm a just... person like you, Wayne. That is what I believe yeah. in, in seeing any situation and that instinctive process that player has definitely tells me how good a player can and cannot be. Now, obviously, if you've got a player that's scoring, you know, two points per game or as, you know, a, a war a certain rating as such you know they're going to be hiring everybody's draft board but when it comes right. to really picking the ins and outs what separates the oil from the water the cherry on top kind of thing how is it that you as a scout in two different leagues now have to process this and saying okay is this player more of a des moines player is this player more of a saber style player like do you reference that and do you make those definitives uh in your ratings oh yeah absolutely i mean uh you know, sometimes it's a little bit cloudy and there's multiple shades of gray, but for the most part, you know, it's pretty black and white when you see a player play as far as where they fit in or, you know, but you also got to look at their potential. And certainly I've developed my own unique set of metrics that I use that I built over time that I use to kind of how I'm going to place a player. It's not just a gut feel. Like I go through numerous criteria I've built on spreadsheets and stuff to see where that person, not only does he slot into the the US PHL in the prep hockey league, or is he USHL? Is he North American hockey league type thing? So it allows me to kind of see where I fit, see that kid fitting in, you know, going into this draft. But is there potential, say, one year, two years down the road? Because you got to continually look at that funnel. And so I've really become a huge fan of keeping track of all that stuff on spreadsheets. I know I, when I first started, I kind of had sticky notes everywhere and stuff. And I think some people still do that but I had to put it into, you know, spreadsheet that I can look at closely analyze. And it, it really makes it pretty easy to then manage it and put this guy above that guy and the other guy below that guy. And so that's kind of how I do it. Wayne, has there ever been, or is there now more of a relationship between all the junior leagues in the United States in terms of not just, not necessarily trades, but, you know, feeder processes where one league may lead you to it. Like you said, another league to the NA to the USHL, 
is there those relationships or is it still pretty much a free for all between the leagues? No, I would say there's relationships and certainly that's what I'm a big proponent of. You know, when I talk to our guys in Des Moines and stuff, and we got a great group there with our GM now is Scott Owens and our head coach, Peter Menino, just a couple of fantastic guys. And, you know, we talk a little bit about, you know, the ways things would go and stuff. And, you know, they like other teams kind of are looking to almost have not a, a farm team, but certainly there's going to be a team or two in the North American league, which would be, you know, the tier two league in the United States, which is comparable to the junior A in Canada. And so if you've got players that maybe are quite on the bubble that quite can't quite crack your USHL squad, well, you want to find them a squad in the North American league that you're comfortable with the, the coach and the program that they can then develop and hopefully become USHL players, you know, later that year or down the road, or you run into injury situations and stuff like that. So even though in a lot of cases, there isn't a formal relationship, there certainly is a lot of informal relationships. And, you know, that's just one example. And then, of course, it goes down to tier three, which is the USPHL and stuff where you'll forge relationships. And so it's really kind of a, a whole production line that I see it as. That you kind of just go through that production line and you're always trying to move a certain amount of those people up into the next phase of the production process, which is the higher league. So, Wayne, you've been based in Canada most of this pandemic, Correct. Correct. So it's how has it been hard for you to look at Canadian players based on the American leagues continuing to play? We've had so many different stoppages here in the Western provinces. Has your efforts and your man hours been more focused on play south of the border? And if so, what have you noticed in the play between Canadians, Americans, international players since Canada as a nation really hasn't played hockey this year? Yeah, that's a big question. But as far as, you know, what I'm watching is obviously a lot more video. Uh, I have been watching a lot of the United States Hockey League. It's a lot of an opportunity to really familiarize myself with all the other teams' rosters, uh, the types of players they have so that we can keep an eye out for, you know, if there's a trade that we require down the road here to bolster the lineup going into the playoffs or for future years. So the pandemic has allowed me to educate myself and get more up to speed on that side of things, which is, which has been a real positive uh, on the negative, obviously the lack of games in junior a in Western Canada has been, you know, a real challenge. There's uh, kids that are on our protected list or affiliate list that, you know, we're going to have to make decisions on uh, yet. We haven't really seen them play. Some of these guys have played one or two games early in the season before it got shut down. So we're got our fingers crossed, hoping that we're going to get a chance to see, some more of them play some games uh, as you're probably aware the AJHL is going to try to get going here and stuff. And we're still waiting on a few of the others and MJ's closed for sure. But uh, yeah, it would be beneficial to, to get to see those kids because, you know, ultimately, I mean, it comes down primarily to the GM and the head coach, but I mean, we're going to be influencers on, you know, what kids are we going to keep, which kids are we going to move on from and who are the new kids we're going to take. So uh, doing a lot more studying, online stuff, you know, researching kids' backgrounds. I've been making a lot of calls to, to coaches and GMs, calling kids and families. And, you know, it all feeds into the matrix that I use that, you know, basically how I rate my players and stuff. And, uh, you know, so it's allowed me to do all that research that probably if I was sitting in rinks watching games, I wouldn't have got a chance to do that stuff. So, you know, I try to take the positive out of it and take, you know, advantage of that time that I do have that I'm not in a rink now. Small silver lining, I guess, Wayne. Mm, yeah, that's why, you know, that's when you get to the lemon, make lemonade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My last question sure. before we go to break, Wayne, I got to ask you, have you noticed, I mean, 20 years ago, it was rare to see Canadians going south of the border to play hockey and it was more wanting of the Americans to come north to be considered, you know, that upper echelon hockey player. We're now seeing great hockey players from all over the world. Has this pandemic really opened the eyes to the rest of the world outside of Canada and you see that trend continuing? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, the fact that the Americans in the U.S. have been able to play hockey through this pandemic has certainly given them a huge advantage. And they're certainly on the, the front of the radar now because, you know, they've been, you know, one of the very few leagues worldwide that have been playing and doing it extremely successful, in my opinion. And so, I mean, that's really brought the attention to the United States and, Certainly from somebody in my position, that's been very, very beneficial because there's a lot of people going into this that didn't really even know of these leagues a whole lot. And so now people that were hockey starved early were watching USHL on uh, hockey TV just to get their fix of hockey. And uh, so a lot of people know about the teams now. 
Uh, obviously, players, when they're making their decisions go forward, they do have to give that some thought. I mean, God forbid there's ever going to be another pandemic, but, you know, who knows when this one ends and when will the next one be? Because as we can see, it really impacts your ability to play. And, you know, I'm not going to argue which one is right and which one is wrong. I mean, most important thing is people's health. But uh, the fact is, you know, American hockey is going on actively and has been all year and in many cases with pretty large crowds. You're absolutely right. The crowds are one thing that we've noticed compared to seeing zero hockey, not even six hockey players on the ice at one time here in all the major provinces across Canada. We'll be right back with Wayne after this break. We're going to talk about the four junior A programs that are are not playing as well as the bubble, the East Division out of Regina. Stay with us on the ice. <laughs> Here on the ice with Wayne Kozier. Wayne, thanks for joining me again this evening. Brought to you by Case and Dokes Oak Fields. The junior programs have been on again, off again, blocked again, not blocked again, code red, yellow. It's all over the map. All we can say is the Alberta Junior Hockey League, the junior A program, is going to try and start yet again. The other three are awaiting an announcement. The MJ's already made that announcement. How hard is that for you, Wayne? Like you said, to look at the player rosters and the, the groups you have on your list, and how do you assess that, knowing that this information has already come about? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sitting on pins and needles, just like uh, I'm sure the players and parents and, and teams are in those various leagues, but I guess I'm in a lot better situation than them. But, uh, I mean, I'm just hopeful that we can see some more hockey. Uh, it's going to allow us and every scout and every hockey team uh, to make better decisions based on actual players abilities uh i mean a uh, a year that most of these teams have been shut down i mean a lot of the league's got a few games in here in the fall and stuff but some of the players really haven't been seen for a year and so a lot of development can or cannot happen over that past year so it, it's going to make it a lot harder so again i'm very hopeful that we're going to see some more hockey as you mentioned the mj has already canceled their season and i know the sjhl is kind of getting down to the you're making a decision there and I guess it'll depend on government approval and the AJ obviously it's it's good that it looks like they're going to go ahead and they've got you know the funding and hopefully deep enough pockets to make that happen and you know BC I mean they haven't even approved the WHL there yet and uh, so the BC is, is challenged and you know I see there was a breakout in uh, Prince George I think in the practice uh, for COVID so that's not good but you know each league and each team has got to do what's right for them in my opinion you know, sad part about hockey, and I guess it's sad and it's good, but I mean, there's a lot of teams that have deep pockets and, you know, big bank accounts. And there's a lot of teams that are just living by a thread. And so, you know, I got to appreciate that different teams got to make different decisions. And I guess we've seen that in Canmore with the Eagles declining to, to play for the, the season, even though it's been approved. So I, I salute that. That's a wise decision, in my opinion. You're right. The decision has to be made on the basis of each team and the safety of all the players and organization. Of course, we're hearing a bit of grumblings, uh, Wayne, with regards to canceling or pushing back a draft year here in junior hockey, uh, making it more of a 16 year old division or 16 year old draft year. Do you see that being more of a positive or more a negative, not just for this year, but in terms of player development and allowing those players to have that extra year perhaps to develop before having that WHL or phase one, two opportunity? Yeah, no, from, from a, a U.S. perspective, I mean, we're not changing. So I haven't honestly given it a lot of thought, but, you know, just hearing that question off the top of my head, I mean, uh, there's pros and cons, I think, to both ways. I mean, there's going to be no perfect scenario. There's always going to be due to this pandemic, there's going to be kids that, you know, maybe fell through the cracks, but on the positive side, there's going to be other kids that are going to be found that wouldn't have been found type thing and stuff. So uh, I, I think it's 50, I'm 50, 50 on it. There's pros and there's cons, uh, you know, just hopefully every player gets a good opportunity to 
to get that opportunity to be recognized and to be drafted. But, you know, at the end of the day, I always tell all these kids that getting drafted is not the, the end of the, the road, right? It's just the beginning of the journey. So what you do from that day on is going to decide where you play, not where you got drafted type thing. So uh, that's the message I would leave with uh, the kids and parents that I know, you know, undergo a lot of stress as uh, they go through this time because it's, it's a big deal to get that recognition. Being drafted is always great to tell your friends and your family and all that. But like you said, how important is that phase two draft process? Because when those players do fall through the cracks or the diamond isn't shining so much in the rough at 16, but it's there at 19, how impressive is that player knowing that they've been given that second or third chance to really excel at a great program? Yeah, it's a fantastic system. Uh, you know, and I guess I'm biased because I'm involved in the USHL, but it's just a great system for teams as well as players because you're only allowed to protect so many players. And the way it kind of works is that, you know, year one of say this year, the 2005 is going to be the draft class. So you're allowed to protect 10 2005s for that year, but then it kind of just starts to gradually cut down each year. So I think the second year you can only keep six of those 2005s and you can only keep say four of the 2004s and, you know, three of the 2002s. And so as you get older, there's less and less that you can protect. So you either got to play them or release them into the pond and let other people pick them up. So it's fantastic for giving players opportunity to play and late bloomers and, and, you know, teams just needing certain role type players, you know, that, you know, 19 and 20 year olds. And that's the great opportunity for Western Canadian kids that I'm always looking for is, you know, what gap do we have in our organization that we need to fill going into the next season? And, uh, you know, those are the guys that I'm looking for. So I'm going to put you on the spot now. What type of Canadian hockey player fits well with either the Sabres or the Buccaneers? Well, I mean, we're always looking for the same thing. I mean, first of all, character and passion for the game. I mean, it's something that you can't fake. Uh when you talk to the kid, you see him on the ice, you know if they have a passion or a love. So you got to see that. They got to have the right attitude. And that's why, you know, I think it's so important to see these kids play because you do see the body language, you know, behind the play on the bench type thing when things don't go well and when it does go well. So, you know, that's always there type thing. So, you know, that type of stuff. And then it comes down to skills. And I mean, it's a little bit different game down in the U.S. in my opinion. I mean, I always say it's a little bit more of a north-south game a little bit less physical. I mean, everybody, everybody will always say, though, the Western Hockey League is probably the closest type of play to the NHL because it's very physical. It's demanding travel, all that type of stuff, bigger players. Typically, the the, the super high-end guys out of Canada are going to stay in the WHL, the young guys, and, you know, there's potential they could be in the NHL by the time they're 18 or 19. Uh, also, just do the style of play in the Western Hockey League. Sometimes, you know, your third and fourth line have to be more role player type guys, some grinders, you know, maybe the odd tough guy, right? Uh, USHL, I would say the lineup is probably more consistent all the way through line ones to four. Uh, you really don't need some of those other components. I mean, everyone needs grinders, penalty killers and stuff like that, but you don't need the physical presence quite as much in my opinion. And so I think we look for a little bit more speed and finesse and stuff. Uh, than would be typically up here in, in Western Canada uh, for the Western League. Speaking of the Western League, is it still the number one junior program in North America that feeds the NHL? You know, it kind of goes back and forth. I think, uh, you know, late it's super close. The, the USHL uh, is, you know, as far as North America, it goes back and forth between the USHL and usually the WHL. But, you know, the OHL has had some good years too. So they've been right in there. But, I still think if you talk to the majority of NHL GMs, uh, they will agree that, you know, the Western Hockey League uh, turns out, you know, those typical Western Canadian type kids that a lot of GMs like, but you can't deny some of the highest skill that comes out of the OHL and the QHL type thing. So, uh, you know, it's just, they're, they're a little bit of three different types of leagues in my opinion. And the USHL is just like a fourth. There you go. The bubble will start in Regina for the seven teams, the East and the, the two teams from Manitoba, the five from Saskatchewan here in mid-March. This weekend, they have to travel to Regina to begin their 14-day quarantine. Wayne, you know this very well as your son plays for Prince Albert, correct? Correct. 
So how has those conversations between him and you been in terms of preparing him? Or have you had those conversations or do you let the team do their thing to get him prepared for this uh, new endeavor to finish off a season? Yeah, I would say it's a, it's a bit of both, Theo. I mean, obviously the Raiders is a fantastic organization and they do an incredible job. And so they've been in contact, you know, regularly all through this whole pandemic, right, since, you know, March last year or February, whenever they shut down. And uh, they've had weekly Zoom calls with all the team on there and stuff and uh, communicating well with the players. And, uh, you know, now they're kind of really into the routine type thing with more regular Zoom calls. Uh, I know Lannon's having a daily workout on Zoom with all of his teammates type thing that's led by their personal trainer and stuff. And so, you know, they're they're really uh, ramping the kids up, getting them ready for the action. And, of course, you know, as a hockey dad, I mean, I'm always helping them out, too, with with tips that can help him improve his game. Uh, being a certified personal trainer, I also try to help him from a fitness perspective and a workout perspective. I mean, it's, you know, the uh, game is getting so, these players are so talented, so fit. They just, you know, do all the right things. It's the, the difference sometimes it might be your conditioning and stuff to who gets the spot type thing and who wins the puck battles and races and stuff. So try to, you know, reinforce that type of stuff with them. And, uh, you know, he's pretty good himself. He studies it up, but uh Bottom line is the Raiders are kind of leading it and they're doing a fantastic job uh, getting him and I think the rest of his teammates ready to, to go into the, the hub this weekend. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. I got to ask yeah. you a question in regards to preparing off the ice. Are these children, young men, ready to be put into this type of scenario where they're playing 24 games, possibly over three months, in a city with very little contact, especially with their family. I don't even know if families are allowed to be in Regina. A lot of these news, a lot of this news hasn't been released as of yet. So, I mean, yeah. do you think these young men are ready for this, Wayne? Well, it's, it's going to be a challenge for, for them, that's for sure. I mean, we've read and seen a lot about it, you know, the various other teams such as the NHL and the World Junior guys and stuff that went through these quarantines and certainly some of Landon's Raider teammates, uh, you know, Caden Gooley, he went through the uh, – the bubble there in the world juniors type thing. So he had some experience to share with Landon and his teammates. And I think the Raiders have kind of used some of that insight to, you know, to develop a protocol, I guess, and a process of how to keep the kids mental health in good shape and to try get them some fresh air type thing. And even though I don't think there's going to be any contact with families, I don't believe, uh, I think that's going to be totally restricted. So it'll just be the players within the bubble and even, the players themselves will be, from what I understand, completely isolated uh, team by team. So there's no interaction. They're all going to be in different room or floors on the accommodations and stuff like that. And the only time they'll interact is when they're they're playing each other. And so, you know, based on what I've seen, just on the, what Landon shared with me and the Raiders have shared with me, uh, I, I think they've got it set up extremely well. Uh, very, very impressed the amount of work that's gone into it to make sure that these young men are looked after from a, a mental and a physical health perspective type thing going into this because it is going to be a challenge being kind of quarantined for two to three months uh, with little interaction and I guess no interaction with your family but other than by a you know FaceTime or whatever type electronic means but uh, same time they're pretty excited and I know Landon's excited to get into that hub and, and get playing because it's been a year. Well that's it that's the news because I mean as lot as as much as we hear things being timid and, you know, conscious of what's going on in the real world. These kids are just looking forward to getting on the ice. I mean, it's almost yeah. like they've been told they can't have their cake and they can't eat it too. <laughs> and now yeah. they've been given this opportunity. Let's not ruin this opportunity for all these teams. And we've kind of touched on the East bubble a little bit. Do you think BC will follow suit or are they just, are they going to be missing the party here? You know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm a bit surprised it hasn't been approved and I haven't heard a lot of stuff coming out of there lately, but so there obviously has got to be some, some challenges that exist within BC and, and, and getting the government approval. But, you know, I'm hopeful that once Alberta gets going here this weekend, I guess, at the, uh, the central division and, you know, in a couple more weeks when the Eastern division gets going, hopefully there's good results and, and hopefully BC will have gotten the approval from a WHL perspective to, to join in. And I'm cautiously, cautiously optimistic that that's going to happen. So uh, that'd be great for those kids. And, and as a, you know, I'm still a hockey parent, so I'm super excited about watching the games as much as anybody. Absolutely. No, I'm glad you're looking forward to it. I'm glad Landon's looking forward to it as well. 
hope to hear the rest of the results and rest of the protocols that will be in place. I mean, fans not allowed, parents aren't allowed. Do the, does the Prince Albert team know their accommodations yet, or are they still awaiting that news as well? Yeah, they're they're aware of where they're going to be staying, and you know I don't think it's any secret that I think all the teams are going to be housed at the University of Regina, uh, at the campus there, in the residences and stuff like that. And I don't know a lot about the details, but as far as what I do know is that they're all going to be kind of sequestered into their own areas where there's controlled access to their floor, and it's nobody but the players and coaches and management that do have assigned rooms there get access there. And I think meals are at least for the initial quarantine period before they start practicing is, you know, meals are delivered to the door type thing and stuff. And those group of players that are share a room that are, you know, quite nice spaces in my opinion uh, will remain in that room and uh, entertain themselves. And I think they're going to do some workouts again. Uh, they've done some good organizing there to uh, they'll do some online tri- uh, workouts like they're doing now. And uh, you know, uh, prep themselves. I've talked to Landon about his mental preparation as far as, you know, focusing on what he needs to do and stuff to, to be successful and uh, use that time wisely and also have a little bit of fun with his buddies and play some video. A little bit of video, a little bit of fun, a lot of hockey, some bumping, some grinding, some wins, some losses. <laughs> You're going to be a very excited parent. He's going to be a very excited player. You've got a lot of programming and planning to do, I'm sure, before your draft with the Sabres. Uh, the end of the season for the Buccaneers. I mean, there's there's no off season for you, is there, Wayne? <laughs> there, there really isn't and stuff. But I enjoy it. It's, I mean, anybody will tell you that's in scouting. You got to do it for the love. You don't do it for the money. And uh, it's a passion of mine that I love. And in some ways, I try to give back to the game and help as many kids as I can and have a lot of fun doing it at the same time. So I really don't look at it as as work, even though it takes a lot of time. Wayne Kozier, thank you very much for joining me on the ice tonight. The director of Canadian scouting for the San Diego Sabres, as well as, are you the head, one of the head scouts with the... Western, Can- Western Canadian scout for the Des Moines Buccaneers of the USHL also. There we go. The Western Canadian scout of the Buccaneers. Do you have a favorite Tampa Bay Buccaneer, or is that a different topic altogether? Completely different topic, but I was cheering for Tom Brady and the Bucs this year, even though uh, I'm not a huge NFL fan, but hey, you got to pick a team when you're watching. <laughs> Well, there you have it. Wayne Kozier, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, good luck with the rest of your off season and your drafts upcoming. And we look forward to watching this East Bubble here on uh, whatever on the Verizon Media that's going to be providing that for us. Thank you again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Theo. Right on. Take care. This is great talk with Wayne there. We're going to chat more about the junior hockey programs as they come to fruition and seeing some of that play upcoming. Thanks for watching On the Ice on ASTV. And all our social media platforms will be here always Tuesdays and Thursdays, 6 Central. Thank you for watching and have a great rest of the evening. Take care.